Good morning. Thank you. Um, it's very different to be on this side of the auditorium. I was all the way back in the corner, and you guys are a little intimidating. So thank you for being here today. Um, I'd like to start out this morning with a video, if we could, please. Next. My therapist says I'm OCD, just because I prefer everything in multiples of three. But I keep telling her that that can't be true, because here are the numbers when it comes to you. Four, that's how many drinks you poured, even though I said I didn't want to drink anymore. Seven, that's how many times you said that if I got too drunk, I could always sleep in your bed. Nine, that's how many times I decline, said I'll be just fine, I'll go home and sleep in mine. 1206, that's what time you leaned in for a kiss, and I told you I didn't want it to go down like this. 24 is the total number of times I said no. Eight times I begged you to please let me go. Two, that's how many times you insisted that if I really didn't want it, I could have resisted. 53 is how many pounds you have on me and why no matter how much I fought you, I couldn't get free. 101 is what the clock said when you were finally done. And by then I'd stopped fighting because you'd already won. 1008, that's what time you called the next day to say you were just drunk and had gotten carried away. 34 is the subsequent calls I ignored while you begged and implored that I please do not report. 27, five women and 22 men. That's how many people I told my story to again and again, just for them to blame me and pick apart my every sin, all because I didn't want to let you win. Three, well, there goes my OCD. That's the percentage of rape victims who accuse falsely, yet somehow you've managed to convince everybody that the exception and not the rule applied to me. 10, 10 is the number of women who said what you did to me, you had also done to them. And who knows how many there had actually been or how many times you would have done it again. 1,265. That's the total number of tears I cried. But zero is the number of tears I have left inside. And zero is how much I'll think of you after tonight. Prisoner 231-6474. By those numbers, you can't hurt me anymore. The incredibly brave and determined soldier in this video is Army Captain Joanna Moore. She's an environmental science officer at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, and she's a real person, not an actor. Joanna wrote this amazing piece of art in just four hours earlier this year after volunteering to participate in the Sharp Awareness Poetry Slam at Aberdeen. She's been writing poetry since she was 10 years old, but she never shared her talents in a public way. When she learned of the SHARP event, she decided it was time to let her words help provide some personal closure and some healing to her awful experience. The words and events described in this poem are very real. Joanna was a victim of sexual assault six years ago as a young Army lieutenant. But it's also blended with the story of a young soldier she recently worked with and mentored who was herself a victim of sexual assault. Joanna used a poetic license to artfully fuse both their painful experiences into one powerful poem. I consider this poem not unlike the soul-shaking letter written by the rape victim at Stanford University that so many of us have read and heard so much about. The national conversations that are taking place right now over the subject of sexual violence are critical. We need to continue to address false stereotypes and bad assumptions that so many people have about sexual assault and sexual assault victims. And while Joanna's poem is specific to her and the young soldier that she helped and mentored, it also speaks to the stories of so many other victims. It's a visceral reminder that rape victims are human beings whose lives are forever changed by an event. <coughs> Joanna did not report her assault. Six years ago, just as the SHARP programs were coming in line full force, she didn't feel comfortable coming forward. The resources, she said, were simply not there to fully uh, convince her to face her accuser. There were no, in her words, safe spaces or trusted advocates. She suffered in silence, but years later, she helped another to come forward and report her abuse. Times have thankfully changed for the better, and we must continue to make progress. 
It's a reminder to me and should serve as a reminder to all of us the opportunities that soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians like you, leaders like you, can have on a daily basis to affect the well-being and readiness of America's Army and all of our services. It's also a reminder of why SHARP programs still matter and will continue to matter for years to come. A reminder that leadership and caring that each of you demonstrate can change lives and make a real difference in the Army and in the world. And next, I'd like us to listen to the words of our new Chief of Staff, General Mark Milley. Sexual harassment in my mind and sexual assault in my mind and sexual intimidation in my mind is a form of blue on blue. It's a form of fratricide. Yes, it's immoral, it's unethical, and it's a crime. But it's more than that. It rips apart the intangibles of an army, of a military organization. It rips apart cohesion. It rips apart good order and discipline, and it absolutely destroys trust. And when you destroy those three elements, you have fundamentally destroyed the readiness of a force. And many of us have seen it firsthand, where you have an incident in a unit, and that unit is fundamentally non-mission capable for a certain period of time. So it's beyond a crime. It's, it's beyond being unethical and just flat out wrong. It has to do with the readiness of our force. And that is why we have to place such an emphasis on the prevention and ultimately the elimination of sexual harassment and sexual assault. That clip was from the Army Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention kickoff ceremony we had in the Pentagon on 31 March. I trust that you have no doubts about what you and the SHARP program means to our Army. Rest assured that the new senior leaders are emphatically supportive of SHARP program. And our new secretary, Mr. Eric Fanning, recently said that taking care of our soldiers, civilians, and families are one of his main priorities. He said, I quote, the Army's strength comes from the care and respect that we show each other. We will support both soldiers and families while they are deployed and take care of them when they return home. This means invigorating efforts to eradicate the cancer of sexual assault and harassment, doing more to recognize the warning signs and stressors associated with suicides in our ranks, and in particular, advance our understanding of and care for those with mental health issues. The Secretary believes that the Army's strength comes from the care and respect that we show each other. Soldiers are not just in the Army, they are the Army along with our civilians. He believes the Army must continue to be an institution that rewards merit while placing equal value on diversity of our ideas, experiences, and backgrounds. The Secretary has pledged to support the total Army and take care of both our civil soldiers and civilians. This means invigorating efforts to eradicate the cancer of sexual assault and sexual harassment. With this new leadership within the Army, there's a renewed focus on readiness. SHARP is a part of this equation. The SHARP program office and our key stakeholders have been engaged in a dialogue about what this means now in the foreseeable future. We absolutely believe that our efforts to reduce the number of sexual harassment and sexual assault incidents facilitates the readiness of our formation. We also believe that these acts of sexual misconduct may be symptoms of a larger issue for the Army writ large and that centers on our value system, specifically dignity and respect. It's important for everyone to understand that the United States Army is a value-based organization and our commanders, civilian leaders, and NCOs are essential to the dissemination of that message. This and always will be our foundation. It's also important for everyone to understand what it means to be a member of a values-based organization. At the HQDA level, we ask ourselves the question, where do we fit into this equation? How do we assist commanders and leaders in their communications with their subordinate leaders? Well, here's how we view the role and know that we do consider all of you our customers. At the end of the day, it's the duty of the SHARP Directorate to draft and implement policy, educate, train, and provide oversight of SHARP professionals so that they can help you fight this battle. If this is done properly, the SHARP community serves as enabler to the commander as he or she empowers leaders like you at every level to enact changes which encourage positive norms, which give way to positive behaviors, which inform the unit's climate, which eventually speaks to the culture of the organization. We want to reinforce that leaders at every level from the squad, level letter, uh, excuse me, squad leader to the Secretary of the Army play an important role in this effort. That's civilian and military. Once the pillars are established and supported by the SHARP community, it creates teams of trusted professionals whose soldiers can believe in. Moreover, they know their opinions and positive actions are valued and respected. 
This fortified system translates into ready individuals, units, and organizations, which assists commanders and unit leaders in their efforts to project a mentally and physically strong force that can fight and win anytime, anywhere. Now, today I'm hoping to learn from you all about what's working and what's not working at HQDA and our, what our SHARP program can do to be more effective and to help you lead this fight. I hope you'll take the time while I'm here today to come and talk to me about your concerns uh, or ask questions later in this presentation. But while I'm here, I want to share a little bit about what our folks are doing with regard to plans and policies, both current and in the future, so you know what's coming down the pike. So I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about where we are now in our SHARP efforts, and let me share a few macro Army-wide observations. Next slide, please. We continue to make progress. In recent years, reports are up and incidents are down. We believe the increase in a rate of reports of sexual assault by service member victims is an indicator of an incre increased trust in commanders and the response system. It does not equate to an increase in actual assaults. We believe the increased trust is a result of unprecedented priority placed on sexual assault prevention and response by Army leaders since fiscal year 12. We as an institution have encouraged victims who have previously were reluctant to come forward and report. But we're not there yet though, as sexual violence continues to occur. That said, we are making quantifiable progress thanks to things like increased knowledge, expanded capabilities, empowerment of soldiers, and bystander intervention. We want to things to continue to go up and reporting to go up. For as more reporting occurs, the more likely offenders are to be held accountable, the more opportunity we have to assist the victims, and we're better able to understand the nature of these crimes within the Army. Next slide. There are many reasons for these positive statistics, but we believe our efforts and advocacy, accountability, and assessment, along with prevention and investigation, to name a few, play a big role. Prevention, or getting to the left of the boom, remains the primary objective of our SHARP program. However, when an incident does occur, the Army initiates a professional investigation to hold the offender accountable while providing best-in-class support and protection to the survivor. At the same time, we are making strides in changing and challenging our culture. It's not easy, as you know. We also continue to reiterate how important leaders like you are fully on board, especially first-line leaders. For anything to truly work, everyone must be involved. This is how we demonstrate our enduring commitment to the SHARP program and our efforts to eliminate sexual harassment and sexual assault, strengthen trust within our formations, and ensure combat readiness. And as we've said, we believe that in addition to being life-changing for its victims, any form of unwanted sexual contact or sexual harassment is an insider threat that is lethal to our culture, to our morale, to our combat readiness, and to everything we are and everything we stand for. In addition to the legacy challenges we face with regard to sexual violence, we realize we're also at a historic moment in time for our Army and in our culture. Those realities will undoubtedly present new and different challenges on the sharp front. I know they'll present new and different challenges for you. Quite clearly, attitudes in the Army have changed and reality has changed and what it means to serve in the United States military. The principles of equal standards, equal opportunity, and equal chance for success guide our efforts. So do the principles of dignity and respect and a safe work and living environment for all to flourish. So again, we're at a historic moment in time for our Army. And with that in mind, our sharp efforts are more important than ever. As we navigate these challenges, we're emphasizing a few specific initiatives. Next slide. From the time we established the SHARP program to now, a lot of work has necessarily focused on establishing a compassionate, professional, and safe response system. Today, we have a dedicated academy where SHARP professionals learn and hone their skills. Today, our SARCs and VAs are credentialed by the same national uh, credentialing authority that credentials victim advocates across the nation. And today, many of our responders work together on sexual assault response teams and SHARP resource centers. No one applies the level of rigor that we do to persons who are nominated for positions of trust. We can and should be proud of the response capability that we have built. So we're ready to take things to the next level. We're ready to move from a profession-centric to a leader-centric focus. In other words, our primary focus is now on prevention. It's one of the reasons the CSA directed the SHARP XORD that was released a few weeks ago. The XORD will serve as guidance and direction until we release the SHARP campaign plan later this year. Next slide. The XORD will help us promote active leader engagement and address issues like the responsible use of alcohol and prevention in the commander's or leader's area of responsibility. It says all Army commands. This includes active guard and reserve. 
must implement active prevention measures and reduce the prevalence of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and retaliation. Execution of the sex order is being accomplished in three phases over a period of 15 months. The first phase is currently underway. Commands all across the Army are evaluating their levels of effectiveness in the prevention of sexual harassment, assault, and retaliation. Commands are identifying vulnerabilities in their organizations and developing mitigation plans to address them. In phase two, commands will monitor the effectiveness and share best practices. And in phase three, commands will assess and revise mitigation action plans as necessary. Our SHARP campaign plan will drive our actions for the next five years and will nest under DOD's strategy, which also emphasizes prevention. The SHARP campaign plan will include a comprehensive assessment plan to ensure we are investing our time, efforts, and other resources in ways that are fiscally and morally responsible and in ways that make a difference. Ultimately, we hope to achieve a culture of dignity and respect where all members are intolerant of any negative behavior associated with the continuum of harm. Sexual harassment and assault are almost non-existent. Members are empowered and have the tools to intervene where necessary, and any victim is comfortable reporting an assault or harassment without fear of retaliation. We will become a blueprint in the nation for the prevention and response to sexual assault and sexual harassment. Next slide. We see bystander intervention as a key strategy to preventing violence as well. It is interesting that our soldiers and civilians are proud to be a force for good around the world. It's how they see themselves. Well, we want them to be the same force for good here at home too. How can we best help them to speak up, to challenge their friends and fellow soldiers, to not remain silent when they witness abuse? And I am anxious to hear your thoughts on this. And civilians, you too can practice bystander intervention in the workplace or out in the town. Anytime someone needs help, civilian and soldiers should feel empowered to step up and assist. Interrupting a potentially harmful situation, and that includes stopping actions or comments that promote a sexual violence. It's just one way to be a hero. So is challenging and changing the cultural norms that make sexual violence acceptable. Bystander intervention is essential in affecting a peer climate and culture. It's what helps define what is wrong and unacceptable in a very public way. This is why we're emphasizing the need to recognize signs of harassment, train people on how to intervene when they see inappropriate behaviors, and to stop it early. To teach them how to have the guts, the courage, the strength, and moral integrity to stand with potential victims, to be leaders of character. Intrinsic to this type of culture is an empowered Army family that intervenes to prevent and or stop sexual harassment. This is critical as research indicates approximately 30% of sexual assaults are often preceded by this type of misconduct. It's imperative that service members, civilians, and family members are able to recognize inappropriate behavior such as sexual harassment and assault and are motivated to take action. In fact, there's one Army division that's developing a leader training called a mind's eye, where the goal is to get participants to recognize their personal filters and how they affect their ability to recognize inappropriate behaviors like sexual harassment and sexual assault, and then motivate participants to take action. They've noticed that a lot of it is people don't recognize what is a potential harassment or an assault that's happening, and so that's part of this education. And our efforts target the potential offender rather than the potential victim. Our premise is that if enough people speak up against sexual offenses, a prevention culture will emerge that universally rejects sexually offensive behaviors. Service members and civilians like you are so integral to that effort. And I'd like to read the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends, and we cannot tolerate the silence. Next slide. The issue of male victimization is also an area of a focus for us. We've got to do a better job in this area in education, outreach, and response efforts. We've moved past seeing sexual violence as an exclusively female problem. We now see that females and males are both being victimized. We have to do better by both of them. We're just beginning to understand the nuances related to male sexual assault, but we will learn and act. Retaliation is another area of concern. Our Army is serious about eliminating retaliation. Still, results from the latest workplace and gender relations survey shows that 50% of female service members who reported a sexual assault perceive some form of retaliation as a result of their reporting. We will continue to work hard with the DOD and sister services to eliminate retaliation and develop programs and policies that help that effort. In addition, we need to be more inclusive of Department of the Army civilians in all of these efforts. 
we must do a better job of ensuring our total team approach addresses civilians. Civilians work with Army soldiers to provide stability and continuity and are valued members of the Army team. Next slide. And I'm pleased to announce we are making progress in this effort. So far, we have developed a civilian guidebook. It is currently undergoing legal review and hopefully will be published this year. We've also proposed changes to annual training so that it's more inclusive of Army civilians. And in February of this year, I know it was mentioned a little in my bio, the Army received permission from the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness for a one-year pilot exception to policy request to expand the scope of services to DA civilians who are victims of sexual assault. Once the SEC Army approves the pilot and implementation plan and the associated Army directive is published, the expanded services are going to include restrictor reporting, meaning that DA civilians can confidentially access a SARC or VA without triggering a law enforcement investigation. In addition, these civilians will be able to see the SARC or VA for victim advocacy, liaison services, and assistance with on and off post resources that are available for civilians. The Air Force has already done a pilot program like this, and it's in place and seeing great results. They've had approximately 35 civilians come forward to report sexual assault and receive advocacy services. In addition, we're working with the Air Force to explore a legislative proposal that will extend SHARP services or SAPR services to all DOD employees and their dependents 18 of older who are victims of a sexual assault. As you can imagine, there are EEO Title VII implications that include disclosure issues and liability concerns that must be worked through. But our pilot efforts will inform the way ahead on this. I hope this gives you sort of a glimpse of what we've been accomplishing with the civilian line of effort over the last year and that you can see we're continuing to move forward. Next slide. So one area that we are severely lacking in in the SHARP program is current Army policy. We have heard you loud and clear. Ms. Farrell created the Policy and Oversight Branch, and I am the Chief to tackle this huge effort. Our current SHARP policy is contained in Army Regulation 600-20, Army Command Policy. The most current version, dated November 2014, contains separate chapters for sexual harassment and sexual assault. I am aware that both of these chapters have not provided commanders, leaders, or SHARP professionals adequate guidance to work with this problem. So we've submitted some significant re um, revisions to 620 and are pleased that they will be published later this fall. They're currently with legal for final review. All SHARP information will be contained in one chapter and will incorporate many of the ALRACs, XORDs, Army Directives, policy memos that are all floating around out there. And this brings up a greater challenge for us. The SHARP program is constantly evolving. Each year, we have to incorporate law and policy changes that come down from DOD, US Code, NDAA, and the Army Command Policy 600-20 is a policy document that covers the regulations for many programs, not just SHARP. And since we don't own the regulation, we can't update it as often as necessary. So to fix this, we're working to publish our own SHARP Army regulation next year. Next slide. This regulation is going to take the information from 600-20 and associated DOD policies as well as U.S. code. It's going to be a comprehensive document that for all aspects of our SHARP program. And for those tangential programs that we don't control, such as uh, legal, criminal investigations, our new policy is going to reference these policies. Our goal is to have a more user-friendly policy that we can update annually, and it will reflect the most recent changes in the SHARP program. So while I'm here, I also want to highlight a few other policy changes you may or may not be aware of. Next slide. Okay. So NDAA 2016, services were given the permission to offer civilians access to special victim counsel if they are the victim of a sexual assault under UCMJ. So the Office of the Judge Advocate General is responsible for this program, and they're currently drafting policy regarding this change. I've realized I've, a lot of stuff is with legal right now. Um, so I've already discussed the revision of 600-20, but specifically it's going to inc include increased information on how to handle sexual harassment response, and it's going to include new forms for the SARCs to use when there's allegations of sexual harassment. Now I do want to emphasize that is for soldiers only. Civilians do continue to go to EEO for any complaints of sexual harassment, and the other services continue to use their equal opportunity advisors for any type of discrimination or harassment. The Army is unique with sexual harassment and assault being in one program, the other services in DOD do sexual harassment and sexual assault separately. I just want to clarify that for you. 
And additionally, we're also creating a comprehensive oversight program consisting of inspection checklists, which is contained in the exhort I mentioned earlier, and it will include site visits, an opportunity for the SHARP headquarters office to spend time teaching, training, and assessing the effectiveness of the SHARP program. It will give us an opportunity to visit the field and find out what is or isn't working with our program and then course adjust. And of course, all of our efforts are coordinated with the other services and the DOD to ensure we provide the best to our service members, civilians, and families. We're all fighting against sexual harassment and sexual assault and working together helps us find the best solutions. Next slide. The Army, the entire military, discipline is the heart of our culture and trust is its soul. And unless and until we get this right, we will erode the trust of our workforce. I know you will not allow this to go on. We're the best fighting force in the world because we take those who volunteer to serve and make them better through training, education, and leadership, developing their physical and moral courage both on and off the battlefield. Sustaining the momentum is also important. We've come so far and we can't and won't let go now. General George Marshall once said, the one great element in continuing the success of an offense is maintaining the momentum. Before I close my remarks, I would like to go back to Joanna Moore, our poet, for a moment. Joanna has recovered from her attack and is actually flourishing thanks to her personal will and resilience. She didn't get over it, she got through it. She's pleased that today's army is different from the one she faced six years ago. There are more advocates for victims, more awareness of the issues, and less tolerance for harassing and violent behaviors. Still, as she mentored her fellow soldier in her own quest for justice, she saw some troubling trends that we must always be cognizant of. Things like confidentiality, trust, and understanding up and down the chain of command. And as leaders in this fight, I urge you to please remember her words and stand up for people like her. Be the hero you are, be a leader of consequence. So thank you for your dedication and thank you for being here today. This is one of the most important missions and one of the most critical challenges our Army faces today and into the future. With your leadership, I know we'll continue to persevere. Next slide. So with that, I know that was a lot of information. I'm happy to answer any questions you all have on any of the initiatives, um, issues, listen to any um, concerns you have. So with that, what is on your mind? What can I help? about Cabbage Seminar 18. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm at home. <laughs> Laura, can you address how, uh, how well our civilian leadership is buying into all the work and effort that we're putting into uh, mm -hmm. SHARP? I mean, mm -hmm. are we making any progress with, uh, with convincing our political leadership that, that, you know, we're in this? And at what point um, do you think, you know, they've said that, that uh, we've turned the corner? Thank you. With the political leadership, I think you have some on all sides. We have some that are definitely in our corner and that are supporting us. And then, of course, there's the ones that make national attention um, that it does seem that we won't be able to do anything to change their minds. Um, but in a lot of ways, we've got people in our corner that are fighting that every year that there are changes to the NDAA. And that's been one of the greatest challenges is for us showing success in the program. And this is DOD as a whole. When the law changes and the way we do things changes every year, it's hard to measure the trends. And so we've got some people fighting in our corner to slow that down. Um, we do, Ms. Farrell, uh, TJAG, they go up to the Hill and do public speaking engagements a lot. They do office calls. And so it's about fostering those relationships with the offices who are helping to support us and protect us. So, does that answer? Laura, I'm Rick Chef. I'm actually an Air Force guy. Um, first, for the first time, seeing the Army version of, of the Sapper program, and it's pretty eye-opening just from what you've already delivered. Um, question on the civilian, um, the, the initiative to put, be more inclusive with the civilian uh, element of our work, of our workforce, at least in the Army. Um, is there consideration being given to foreign nationals that are under on the DoD um, payroll, as well as contractors? Uh, being afforded some of the same um, benefits to this uh, included in this program. 
Yes, but that's even more challenging, as you know, with the different um, foreign nationals, the, the SOFA agreements. Um, so they're, we're doing baby steps. We were starting with the civilians first, and then that'll be the next issue we tackle. Contractors um, can, if they do feel that they are being harassed, they can also work with EEO in certain circumstances, so that is an option also. Um, but we do have to work more to include them in our program as well. But those are future initiatives for sure. Hey, Laura, uh, Lynn Scheel from Seminar One. Question, how, what are we doing in regards to the sessions as far as trying to maybe nip this problem in the bud a little bit? I mean, we already have current military forces already in, but as far as the new recruits, is there any changes to how we assess and how we evaluate whether a recruit is suitable for military service from a sexual harassment standpoint? Thank you. I do know there are people much smarter than me working on that. Um, as you can imagine, there's all kinds of questions that come into play about if someone hasn't done something yet, how do we hold that against them? But they are taking a look at the best way to assess um, the character of service members before we bring them in the Army. Um, so I do know there are programs going on with that right now.